Welcome to the Language of Love with me, Dr. Laura Berman, joined by someone really special. I'm so excited to introduce our guest this week's episode, Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. Uh, welcome. Hi, Laura. Thank you so much for having me on your show again. It's such an honor to be here. I'm very happy to have you. Um, Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. is a Toltec Master of Transformation, direct descendant of the Toltecs, author of five books, including the topic that we're going to talk about today, his book uh, that he wrote with Heather Ashimara called Seven Secrets to Healthy, Happy Relationships. And I don't know if you remember, um, do, do you like being called Miguel or Don Miguel? It's like people asking me, do I want to be called Dr. Laura or Laura? Uh, and I, what's your opinion on well, that? Well, I like Bingo, you know, it's, it's, yeah. uh, I usually tell people, it's like, yeah, you can introduce me first with Tom Miguel Ruiz Jr. And then after that, just Miguel, it's fine. It's, 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 yeah, that's how I yeah, am. It's, it's a term of endearment, you know, it's kind of like it, yeah. it allows us that intimacy sometimes. That's right, into me see. So Miguel, I don't know if you remembered, remember, but I was at your um, shaman's gathering in Sedona yes. and I came up and introduced mm -hmm. myself and actually I gave you a copy of my yeah, book. Yeah, yeah, I have it upstairs. Yeah. Want some love. yeah. Um, so I went with two girlfriends and actually that was the first big community outing. I, I mean, I wasn't alone in that cause I think a mm -hmm. lot of people have been obviously isolating and this was one of the first big gatherings that a lot of people have attended. But for me, as I think I told you when I met you, my uh, son, Sammy, passed away six months mm -hmm. ago. And so I was so I went with these two beautiful soul sister girlfriends that were sort of girding me on both sides. And we had this beautiful weekend with you all. Um, and I actually posted if you if you follow me on social media, I'm not I know you don't need to follow me, but people listening, if you follow, you saw a lot of my um, posts from when I was there. Um, and it was really beautiful. You, I, this was the first one I'd ever been to, uh, a shaman's gathering. I know you all sort of have been doing it every year, right? For the last five, six years, yes. Yeah, it was beautiful and um, very profound. And what I loved, not I mean, obviously all of the presentations and your wisdom that you all were sharing uh, was really beautiful. But what really struck me, because I do a lot of events and I go to a lot of events, is the community of shaman and training all the attendees there was so many i don't i, I don't know if you saw because you were probably too busy working but where at whenever you walked around campus there were people making drum circles or mm -hmm. dancing together or you know it was really a beautiful yeah. community and i know that's in large part a testament to you and the other guides and teachers you know the community that you bring around you but i just wanted to compliment okay. you on that too because i know you all have a huge part to do with the people yeah, you attract. It's, it's, it's a it's a wonderful community. You know, the uh, Randy Davila with Inside Events does a great job with that project, and uh, Mago Retreat Center in Sedona they do a great job. They they they're a great tag mm -hmm. team, and then having all the teachers, yeah. you know, every every teacher there brings a different element to the event that allows us to mm -hmm. commingle with one another. You know, it's like the people who follow Heather Ashamara. Yeah. Uh, the people who uh, follow Star Wolf, or myself, or every, everyone else in the in the panel, it's a it's a wonderful mixture of approaches to self healing, to love, to yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and that's really I thought was powerful about shaman. You know, the idea of shaman. How it like just talk about you know this idea of shamanism. That sort of was the headline, I think, of the weekend, is that it's really about self-healing, right? It's about well, no, how exactly would you describe that's it. it? It's, it's about healing. You know, the, For me, uh, a shaman is a healer. As you, you can say that all mm -hmm. ceremonies are, have the intent or purposes of grounding in the sense of finding that experience that allows us to heal a wound in our being, in our psyche, in our, in our well, in whatever it is that is our self and we give ourselves that opportunity and what i remember telling everyone at the event is that you have different channels of different teachers here and look for the things that resonate with you that thing that resonates with us is the thing yeah. that allows us to not just relate but 
it speaks to a truth in us and that's what allows us to give ourselves the permission to heal so for me a shaman as a faith healer or even a doctor uh, there are instruments for the patient to heal themselves. You know, I, I was born and raised in a family yeah. of healers. My father being a medical doctor, my mom being a dentist, my grandmother being a faith healer, my grandfather being a faith healer, um, and uncles who are doctors as well. If, if anything, I've learned from watching the two different types of healing, you know, with Western medicine and non-traditional or traditional uh, homeopathic and uh, natural remedies, healing, um, mm -hmm. is that the patient uses the doctor, the nurses, the practitioner to heal themselves. You know, it's, it's about being the willingness to, yeah. to heal yourself. It's like, I, you know, for example, the, the doctor will set something up. You know, for example, I just took my son to, he had a, a toe infection. And I took him to see his doctor. The doctor, mm -hmm. you know, prepared his toe, made an incision to let all that pus out, to clean the thing out. And my son, you know, did his very best to handle the pain and then breathe. And I'm there holding his hand, giving him, like, comforting in his anxiety. Oh, my son has horrible. autism. And, uh, and yeah, the so thing about harder. it is that... It, all required my son letting me and my wife know I don't feel good. Then making the appointment and we go there and the doctor becomes an instrument yeah. that allows my son to heal. In the same way I, I see a right. shaman, a shaman is an instrument that allows me to heal. And in order to heal, it requires awareness. You know, for example, my son, as simple as it is, yeah. came to us and let us know my foot hurt of course he had some behavioral issues with his autism and and Tourette's and things like that so you know we heard right. some pounding first and some some uh anger coming from him and then he finally said my foot hurt that that acknowledgement is what we know oh, as awareness good. i am aware yeah. that there is something that hurts now in my son's yeah. case it is something physical something tangible something that you can see but a lot of us have wounds that you can't see. It's, 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 in our, it's in our persona. It's in our heart. It's in our mind. It's in our, in our whatever it is that we want to address mm -hmm. that needs that healing. You know, our memories, our, our anxiety, our disbalance. It requires that moment to have that awareness that something is off. And once you accept it, now you can take a step further and find that healing that resonates. First with my son, we, we uh, got a, a little, um, we put some water and salt into a little tub to help with the swelling. We had some antibacterial uh, cream, that mm -hmm. how, uh, how we put it in. That was the home remedy thing that me and my wife had. The next morning we saw, okay, that didn't work. Yeah. Luckily for us, we made the appointment. We went into the appointment. We, pre we prepared my son emotionally for what's going to happen. We let him know what's going to happen. We, we watched some YouTube videos so he can see what's happening so yeah. he's not surprised. And so we can say he prepared himself for it em emotionally, intellectually. He prepared himself for that. Yeah. And then the moment came where the procedure happened. You can call this procedure a ceremony. The doctor cleaned his hands. The doctor gathered his equipment. Mm -hmm. The doctor talked to us, yeah. then he proceeded to do the thing. He finished, he made sure that everything is clean, and then he gave us instructions as we went home. In the, in, in a shamanic practice, it is something quite similar. You have an aha moment. You know that something is off. You go to the, thing, to the person you resonate with. In this case, it would be a shaman. You're, you resonate with the lessons and teachings of a shaman. And you go into a ceremony, and in the ceremony, you do the thing that allows you to let go. You know, I'm thinking, for example, of you write a little in a yeah. piece of paper that wound. You, you, you write or you write in a journal that what moment. Yeah. Or you had us do something at, the, mm -hmm. yes. at your event where we went out and took yes, rocks. Yes, exactly. 
Iraq to represent yes, and, what and we that, wanted to let go of and then exactly, physically and that's basically release it. awareness. We're yeah, bringing that's a good into example the forefront of, of our attention that which we want to heal. Yes. And as we prepare ourselves emotionally for we tell our story about, you know, in this in the and example of the stones. Action. You know, you, you, you pick up a stone and that stone becomes a symbol that represents that wound, that condition, that thing that makes us feel inferior or makes us, brings pain into our life. We look at how that impacted our life. Mm -hmm. We understand what domestication is and we understand what, how it impacted our relationships. But once you, once you get that point, you come to the, right. the, the I'm, ceremony I'm not... itself, which is, very simple. Do I want to keep this in my life or not? If I don't, then that's when we take the step of forgiveness. That's the example we did in the ceremony in, in Sedona. I forgive myself for ever saying yes to this. Or I forgive myself for allowing this to continue to hurt me beyond that yeah. moment in time. Yeah, it's like mm -hmm. the awareness, the recognition, the release and the forgiveness or forgiveness and release, which is so crucial. And and what I love, you know, I, I knew some about shamanism, but not as much as I learned over that weekend. But what I love about it mm -hmm. is that it's very it's fundamentally what I already subscribe mm -hmm. to and do in my own work, mm -hmm. which is like healer, heal thyself first. Right. Like we have to, which I do think is a distinction between mm -hmm. the more shamanistic approach, not that one is better than the other. And Western medicine mm -hmm. is that a, a doctor prescribing medicine, you know, he has to mm -hmm. be somewhat self-aware, but oh, yeah. he doesn't he, have to he, have he done all the give, personal like, healing have, work yeah. that a really that, good shaman has that, to you know, do. <laughs> I remember someone talking about and complaining about yeah, all these authors yeah. sharing their stuff. And I told this person, you do know that all these people who are teachers or authors, went through all this stuff and they got out on the other side and now they're sharing what helped them with us and that's what resonates you know yeah that's that's what that's what allows us to see the humanity of an individual yeah heal learn teach so you mentioned domestication which i want to get to in a minute that's a fundamental teaching of of your work of of like perhaps all of shamanism but um and we're going to talk about what that is but it in the con i want to mention your book first of mm -hmm. all your most recent book uh seven secrets to healthy happy relationships and we're not going to get into all of these but the seven secrets are commitment freedom yes. awareness yep. healing okay. joy communication and release did i get them all okay so mm -hmm. um but it starts, right? Yes. What you talk about is the fundamental underpinning of this is unconditional love. And that, mm -hmm. and we're going to get yes. to domestication and exactly what that is. But domestication is basically a block, right? To un unconditional love. Sure. So will you just talk for a moment about the difference oh, between unconditional yeah. versus conditional love? Well, first, let's say Because everybody has a different definite. I mean, we can guess what that is, but as you define it. It's, it's always good to have that foundation. Love is an energy that allows us to create a bond between an individuals, yeah. between ourselves, yeah. between life. It is the thing that brings us together. It's a beautiful thing. Yes. So with that understanding, yes. the difference between that. conditional and an unconditional energy. love it is an energy. to me is that conditional love only sees what it wants to see. And unconditional love is the willingness to see life as is. It is willingness to see the whole. So you can say that what corrupts love you know my father always taught me the opposite of love is not hate or anger hate and anger are just the instruments by which you implement the opposite of love which is love the opposite of love is love to put it simple the opposite of unconditional love is conditional love very simple conditional love mm. yeah and what i mean by that is this so people in use our books, and from the four agreements, to my father's book, the four Got agreements, it. to my own books, to my brother's book, all the books in our family deal with domestication, a system of reward and punishment by which we model the behavior of an individual, where if we live up to an expectation, we're worthy of a reward. And if we fall short of that expectation, we're worthy of the punishment. And since we are emotional beings who experience the full spectrum of our emotions, 
that reward feels like acceptance, mm -hmm. which feels like love, and the punishment feels like rejection and the lack thereof of love. Is the way we run conditional love. Yeah. Yeah. I love you if you live up to my expectation. Now, the example I love to give is that of and myself. Hello, my name is Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. If you have an expectation of what that means, you think of this individual that always does his best, is not doesn't take things personal, doesn't make assumptions. <gasps> I forgot the fourth agreement. Oh no! How can I call myself Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. if I don't know the four agreements? And there is the downward spiral of judgment punishing me for not living up that expectation of perfection <laughs> where Don right. Miguel Ruiz Jr. doesn't take things personal, doesn't make assumptions, always does his best, and he's impeccable with his word. Thank you very much. If I live up to the expectations, I'm worthy of the name. I'm worthy of the image. I'm worthy of whatever it is that Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. represents. But if I forget, for example, the fifth agreement, be skeptical, but learn to listen. Oh no, there I go again. I fall short again. And there's a diatribe of judgment punishing myself for not living up to that image. At that moment, I'm basically using the four agreements as an instrument yes. of domestication where if I live up to the four agreements or five agreements, I'm worthy of not just my name or the, my, the totic tradition, but I'm worthy of love. I'm worthy of acceptance. I'm worthy of so many things. But if I don't, I only get the punishment. It's kind of like the equivalent of saying, in order to be perfect, which and is something that is completely free of any flaw, I have to be yeah. 27 years old, weigh 170 pounds, and have hair like my brother Jose. And if you ever see my brother Jose, he has long, flowing hair. It's beautiful. You know, it's like Fabio, Fabio has nothing on my brother. You know? <laughs> he does But nice I look at myself hair. in the mirror, and that's just not the truth. I am 45 he years does. old. I weigh 195 pounds. Yeah. And I'm I'm definitely balding. But because I don't live up to the expectation, I'm going to judge myself. You fat bleep. You old fat bleep. You bold oh. old fat bleep. If you ever heard... Yeah? Yeah. Or it's... It, it's easy to say societal, but and it that's really a result of societal domestication, yes it, right? Like or, or sometimes and that's in our most, families. That's a like very mine. important uh, <laughs> distinction. Society, like a culture or a family yes. or individuals yes. or friends or beloveds, they might try to impose their domestication on you, but it still requires us for us to agree with it. So in this case, yeah. Okay, so let's pause for mm -hmm. let, let's just pause for a minute because I want people to understand yeah, if, con it, what conditioning. we're talking about when we talk about yeah, domestication, yeah. So that's what domestication, which is, is. fundamentally I love you creating if you conditional live up to love. Expectation. So domestic, Some people prefer so the word define what domestication because they is. say, "Well, we humans don't get domesticated; only animals do." But yet, okay. conditioning and domestication are exactly the same concept. Yeah. So in this example, you know, ah. domestication basically is. The yeah. way we, we are animals. Learned how to love ourselves with conditions if you want to be worthy of the family name. And in this case, the four agreements becomes the four conditions, the instruments by which I love myself con conditionally using the four agreements as a corrupted version of it. Yeah. And that's... Yeah, exactly. It's an instrument of, of, of unconditional love. But it's, right, supposed it's, but to be something we're that so frees you, to not that you use to judge yourself. That we will corrupt all these things, not just the four agreements. We'll de corrupt Deepak Chopra, Maryam Williamson, Jesus, Buddha, Siddhartha, Muhammad, psychology, psychiatry, Alcoholics Anonymous. Humanity has created... Sorry. <laughs> and use it as a way, yeah. And so those... So those judgments that we create of ourselves, right, when we self-domesticate, the idea is, yes. which is something I obviously believe as a therapist and work with people, is to recognize yeah. where those stories come from, right? And, and you've talked a lot about this in your own life and in your, and in your writing, that, um, that each of us, you know, there, we as parents do this to our children unconsciously, 
until we learn otherwise. And even then we're obviously not perfect. It was done to us because our, our yeah. caregivers, because not it's, just it's our an community that being, somehow or, allows or literally, us like you were saying, approved for children, approval and love the are the other, same thing. The other and uh, because, side of domestication, the, the subjugation of someone else's will, according to the point of view. Yeah. Like, for example, one of my favorite quotes is by Eleanor Roosevelt, which goes, no one can make you feel inferior without my consent. Your consent, sorry. If I, if I paraphrase, no one can make me feel inferior without my consent or no one can domesticate me without yeah. my consent. The question yeah. is, how do we give consent? And the answer is very simple. By agreeing with it, by saying yes to it. That's how we give yes. consent. So yeah. to me, the moment I become aware that I said yes, it doesn't yeah. matter if it's societal or family or friends. I'm the one who said yes. To me, if, if, if the consequence of domestication or conditioning is that I lose trust in my own ability to say yes and no, because personal freedom is to be able to say yes and no with a complete freedom of life, that my no is just as powerful as my yes. But like Uncle Ben told Peter Parker, with great power comes great responsibility. To have personal freedom is to be able to say yes and no with that freedom to say yes to the things I want to say yes to and no to the things I want to say no to. And with that comes the responsibility of I will experience the consequences of my own choices. I am responsible for my own will. So from that point of view, it, mm -hmm. that's what I've been saying to my 23 year old. Yeah. At this and, point. and that's the thing. You know, it's like, whatever it's, I did to screw you up, you I take responsibility it. for, you know, but at this point, an, an analogy that <laughs> it's I love. up to you to heal it. A scorpion that decides to no longer sting itself with its own poison. Mm -hmm. I love that analogy, and I use it to compare, compare it to another lesson of uh, someone taught me in Sacramento, which goes like this. Forgiveness is the moment you no longer wish the past was any different. It is the moment you accept it and you let it go. To accept it means that you know that you can't go back in the past and change a yes to a no or no to yes because life mm -hmm. no longer exists in the past. So you can't make yeah. the changes. It, it, it happened. To let it go simply means that I will no longer right. use the past to, to hurt me and impact me in the present. And that's where the analogy of the scorpion comes in. It's the moment where the scorpion no longer decides to sting itself with its own poison that it meant for someone else. But it's so used to that domestication or condition or pain that it or pain that he or she is used to, or it, it's the moment where I choose to no longer hurt and move on, kind of like the ceremony we were talking about with the stones. The moment of forgiveness is the moment we drop that stone and we no longer let it infect our present. Mm -hmm. So in, the, mm -hmm. in our domestication, you can say that conditional love is implementing that emotional poison Letting someone else's point yeah, of view, letting someone really else's beautiful. prejudice or ideas of what love should be. And we continue to believe it until the moment comes where we realize, you know, I no longer believe it. And I, it, it, is, it usually is a moment of clarity where I become aware of what I've created. You know, it's like you, you use the example of your son that, yes, at one point, yes, you taught him domestication. But at one point, it's his journey. And that journey will yeah. come the moment where... I no longer believe that domestication. And then... Yeah. Yeah, and then... It, but it, the, the way that forgiveness comes, comes the moment mm -hmm. when and we're I'm able no to see our parents to it as, and I let it as, go. And uh, I forgive you, Mama. Tears. For me, when my <laughs> son was born, you know, I read What to Expect When You're Expecting. I read all the books. I, 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 I had that wisdom in the sense of, of reading yeah. from books. But when I held my son in my hands, in my arms, I realized I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm doing, and then I realized the thing that we parents don't tell kids or our pe other people is that we don't know what we're doing. As soon as we get used to being the parent of a one-year-old, yeah. they turn two, making everything we know about parenting irrelevant. Then they turn four, they turn eight, they turn 12, and every birthday yeah. seems... Yeah, exactly. It seems like every birthday makes everything we know about parenting irrelevant because the yep. person we're raising is changing in front of us. 
and, and that's when I realized that my them. parents have been doing yeah. it, playing it by ear for all that time. And also you realize you take off the mask of mom and dad and you see the two people who did their best with what they've got. And they only shared in this big, <laughs> basically, sometimes this is the moment where you become an adult when you no longer yeah. see mom yeah. and dad as this um, yes. Yes. end all, like, how can I put it? We don't see our parents as this official godlike being that we put in a pedestal. It's the moment we take off the mask and we see them as human beings who are doing the best with what they've got. And once you see that from from that point of view, it's easier to forgive because you see them in the same way you see them yourself. We're doing it our best. And that's when real shifts becomes a happen. Sometimes that happens if you have a kid. Sometimes it happens when you don't. It, it, it all comes to, to the moment when the individual yes. realizes that our parents are just human beings who are, are doing their best with what they've got. And eventually it stops being their responsibility to raise us and it starts being my own. For example, in, in a presentation, I was talking about how yeah. I was dealing with the anxiety of raising teenagers and how it's going to be out there in the world, especially with one of them with special yeah. needs. And then I became a, a line, help me, which goes, how to raise an adult is basically to teach them how to survive without me. And also it, it dawned on me, my job as a, as a parent now is to teach them how to survive without me. That's the gig. It's, 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 it's the moment where mm. they take off the life vest that me and my wife put on to them and they decide that, I got this, oh. and I'm going to take this life vest yeah, because is. I have confidence in myself to make those choices. And as I use that analogy, we're both, I've been the parent, I am the parent, and at the same time, I've been the son. My mom and my dad took off that vest or let me take off that vest yeah, a long be- time yeah. ago. Yeah, that's Mm -hmm. true. And that's very powerful. And we've talked, you know, we've been talking about domestication um, and and in terms, and actually we've talked about some of the secrets, right? Awareness, becoming aware, releasing, you know, committing to to unconditional love, domestication that we do to ourselves. But I love how you talk about the ways in love. And I know you cover this in the book as well, um, that that we usually unconsciously domesticate or try to domesticate our partners, you know, especially when we have differing viewpoints. Right. And I love, there was something, a a note I took. um, Hold on. I'm going to try. I took a lot of notes when I was reading your book, but um, I was thinking um, there was something that you were talking about with, um, Mm -hmm. with your partner, when you disagree about something Mm-hmm. And you're basically trying to, oh, I know what it was that was so powerful. It's simple. It was about imposing your will. Basically, mm-hmm. you're taking away your partner's freedom when they disagree with you and you're just innocently, which I try to do all the time, innocently trying to convince your partner to agree with you when they have a very clear no or yes, the mm-hmm. opposite of you, that there's a way in which you are imposing your will and attempting to domesticate yeah. and subjugate them. This will, was the yeah. big aha. Make them doubt their yeah. own will. Like the only I way only you get them to come the to your side is if you get them will, to doubt themselves. And something that really that struck took a long time me. Will you talk about that? Understand. What do I control in this world? And the only thing I truly control is my will and my perception. I'm the infinite possibility because I'm alive at this very moment. My yes is a very powerful thing because with that three-letter word, I can use the intent, the energy that animates my body to create anything. I can go in any direction I want. My mind can think of all these possibilities, and if I like one of them, I'll say yes to it. My no is just as powerful as my yes because that two-letter word represents the moment where I choose not to use the energy that animates this body, that animates this mind to manifest a single thing. Yeah. And for as long as I say no, thy won't be done. 
my no is just as powerful as my yes. Like I was saying before, my yes and my no, also known as my will, to have personal freedom is to be able to say yes and no with a complete freedom of life. Mm-hmm. I am free. You can say that's the first secret, freedom. To recognize the power of my own will or my own intent, yeah. whichever word we prefer to use. I am free to go in any direction. And the commitment is yes. to give yes. myself that opportunity to heal, You know, to let go of that domestication in my mind and give myself the permission to heal, which comes with the awareness, what am I healing? So in my relationship, I am the constant in every relationship that I am in. So let's take my wife, for example. My wife is also free. Yeah. She is my equal. She is my equal because she is alive at the same time as I am alive. We're both living beings with the full capacity to go in any direction in life. And here's the thing. She mm-hmm. controls to the tips of her yes. fingers her own will and her own intent, just like me. And here's the beautiful part. Two individual beings who have gone through life met and fell in love. And we've been saying yes Yes. to one another ever since. The relationship between she and I exists because we're both saying yes at the same time. And that's true of every relationship. Every relationship exists for as long as those two people are saying yes. Because the moment... One changes that yes into a no, Mm -hmm. it ceases to exist. That relationship ceases to exist, which means my relationship with my wife exists because with our own freedom, we're saying yes. Now, here's the thing. The only thing that will exist in our relationship are the things that we both say yes to. If she says no to something or I say no to something, that won't be done. You see, to respect her, is to respect her ability to say yes and no to the things she wants to say yes and no to, just in the same way I respect myself. I respect my no just as much as my yes. And my no is just as powerful, which means my wife's no is just as powerful as her yes. To respect my wife is to respect her no. No means no. But I'm very grateful that she's saying yes. My, My wedding ring has power It means something because it represents both she and I are saying yes to one another. No means no. Now, here's the thing. There's the expression, if you love someone, set them free. That means that my wife, at any given moment, she can change that yes into a no. If I do something stupid or she just simply goes in in a different direction in life, she has every right to say no. In fact, this wedding ring doesn't really stop her. You know, and there's no amount of domestication that can really stop her once she really has personal freedom. And that's true. Of yeah. yeah. Exactly. Every, every relationship, sorry, every relationship exists for as long as we both say yes. So to set someone free is yeah. to respect that. And that, that makes you not work. keep her, for, not, not take her for granted, fingers, right? Because you both which allows understand me that. To, like you were saying, not to take for granted this relationship. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's right. Mm-hmm. But I do have a question about this. Um, as a recovering mm-hmm. codependent who has had to, because of my own mm-hmm. domestication and, you know, uh, very early on, you know, I would say one of my biggest challenges has been discern- what I would call mm-hmm. discernment, knowing, like we were talking about before, knowing my true no and yes, and yep. and not being, mm-hmm. uh, not being, not moving into questioning that in in the face of someone's disagreement who I care about. And so, a lot of my adult life has been creating these boundaries, right, and really honoring my boundaries. But for someone like me, and there are millions of us. Um, how do you how would you describe distinguishing between oh. a healthy no for instance a healthy boundary that is about really honoring your authentic self and a boundary mm-hmm. that is really a result of 
domestication or, you know, doubt, you know what I mean? Like how do, or your very ego much, or whatever, simple, like how do you uh, really know when that boundary, for those of us who doubt our boundaries question. when they're hard to hold, um, how do you know our emotions are that real. that boundary is coming from a our healthy place? Our emotions are real. So when we feel those emotions, that's how we feel. So for me, the telltale sign that a boundary, a no, <laughs> comes from unconditional love is I don't have to say no with anger. I have complete confidence and trust in myself to say no to the things I want to say no to. I'm, my boundary is there to protect this living being. A no giving with anger mm. is basically uh, saying, you know, for me, a lot of people think, well, a few people, whoever resonates with this, actually, I'll, I'll use that phrase, whoever resonates with this. Anger is actually giving away your power, even though it makes us feel mighty and strong and we can do whatever we want with, when we say no with anger. It's actually a crutch because we're not confident in our no, so we have to use our anger to reinforce it. And from that point of view, I don't trust my no, and I have to only be able to say it with anger. And usually that comes with pain of course a wound that's there but ah, it's like, also the way we've learned how to assert ourselves so from that point of view when i'm learning to assert myself which simply means i'm learning how to say yes and no and my no like imagine i'm eight years old and I'm, i know how to talk and i'm saying no to mom no to dad mm -hmm. at that moment i'm gaining my confidence to say no but if they really want that yes and this is where the, uh, uh, the other question comes in. If I'm saying no, but they really want that yes, they're going to use an instrument that allows me, sorry, it allows them to change that no into a yes. And that yeah. usually is doubt. Look at you. You made this mistake. You made that mistake. Let me think for you. You can say, exactly. So let's, let's, let's put first the first contrast when I said yeah. to respect my wife is to respect her no just as much as her yes, which means imagine two, her index finger touching mm -hmm. my index finger. Or you don't and know, or those you're fingers, not good at figuring like things ET, out. Represents, or represents not, respect. Yeah. With two individuals who come together and the only thing that will exist between she and I are the things we both say yes to. And that's how we create the dream of us or the relationship mm -hmm. between us. The only thing that will exist in our relationship are the things we both say yes to. If she says no to something or I say no to something, it will not be a part of it. It doesn't happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It doesn't happen. Yeah. And that's where I think a lot of couples get stuck. And you talk about this, I know, about, you know, those big kahunas, money, religion, children, those sex even, you know, those big four topics that couples seem to have the most problems with. And then you really do, every single couple is going to come to many if you have a long relationship and are engaging in any of these things together and you're human, you're going well, to come across that, you know, cause, cause, one of you, you know, with, a no, one of you um, with a very clear no and one of you with a very clear yes. All right, yes. so wait a minute. Okay, and let me, let me still balance things out because you know, the other is, question okay, is still, is still up in the air. And then, right? Like, let me, and then let how me, do you decide let me ground which it. direction no, to it, go? Uh, I'm going to make stone soup because it's the way you put it is perfectly. Yes. All right, so in in the example of me and my wife, because uh, we obviously she says no to things. Well, so keep going with and the I other question. No we things. can hold and this. And when we were a young couple, we would fight. You know, most of the cup fights or arguments that couples but have I, is but, who's going to domesticate who. Because whoever controls the yes of a relationship controls the relationship. And this is where we begin to go beyond. You know, we can say that if you have that image of the fingers yeah. who are touching and with mutual respect, if I want that yes and I want that no yeah. or something like that. You can say we, I start pushing back and forth. Yeah. All of a sudden, it starts being who controls. And then there's a line of respect which one of them crosses. And they try to impose their will on the other. And the other one subjugates their will. I love you if comes into play. If you want to be with me, yeah. you better yeah. live up to this expectation. If you want to be with me, you have to 
do this. You have to do that. This is what a woman is supposed to do. This is what a man's supposed to do. This is what, and we begin yeah. to project because that's, we can say that what the majority of what we see out there is a battle of yeah. wills of who is going to control yes and no in the relationship. So a lot of people who become yeah. dependent yeah. tend to subjugate their will so that please don't leave me. I will do anything you want. At that moment, that person subjugates their will and the other person imposes their will. And some say that's called peace, but it's not peace. It's a lack of respect on both ends. On, on the other, on the, on the imposing, the person who is imposing their will, yeah, they don't respect the will of the other individual. The subjugated person, yeah. in this case, doesn't yeah. respect their own yes or no. They've given in to the self-doubt. And that, mo that look... No. Yes, and you can run away, but that's the thing is that eventually you're going to uh, face that one relationship where you don't want to right. run away. And that's where it usually happens. The so finger pushing doesn't even have to my push. Wife and they I, just pull it back. In our relationship, <laughs> started something we call the art of yeah. arguing. In the art of arguing between she and I, because us, we used to argue a lot, especially yeah. when we were young and yeah. in our, we've been together 17 years and we've been married for 15. And we used to fight a lot about money, about how to raise, you know, nothing brings out a culture clash like raising children. And, you know, I, I, my wife and I come from two totally different points of view. You know, I grew up in the city. I grew up in San Diego and Tijuana. She grew up in the farm. In, in the South Lake Tahoe area, sorry, in, in a Salt Lake City area. She grew up Mormon. I grew up Catholic. So raising children yeah. comes, you know, bring, brings out a culture clash. All right. So the art of argument came like this. My grandfather always taught me that if you're about to put your foot in your mouth, button your lip. If you already put your foot in your mouth, button your lip even harder. Something my yeah. grandfather said, and he passed away when I was 14 years old. But it, it stuck with me. So when me and my wife would be fighting, because here's the thing. When couples come and ask me for advice, I always ask them the same question. Do you guys want to stay together? If they both say yes, the rest is easy because that mutual yes is the motivator yeah. that allows us to get through the hurdles of a lot of stuff. Someone who's just simply dating, when they reach that first hurdle, they'll break up. You know, kind of like the way you were describing, run away. You break up. But then you meet someone who it's a little bit more committed, and you reach that first hurdle, and that yes is a little bit stronger, and you'll go through a few hurdles until you hit that one hurdle that's, like Samantha Jones would say, it's a deal breaker. You'll, mm -hmm. you'll, you, you, yeah. you, you break up. Or you'll just... Then you have that yeah. one relationship where that yes is that strong. And you're willing to work through it because this person, this relationship is worth the effort. <laughs> yeah. You know, like my dear friend Kirk would say, is the juice worth the squeeze? Which to me means, is the consequence worth the effort? Yeah. Is the relationship worth the effort? And if we both say yes, that's easy. If they both say no, that's also easy because they're both saying the truth. It's difficult when one says yes and the other one says no. Mm -hmm. That's where it's complicated. So for me, in the arguments my wife and I were having, you know, normally, yes, we yeah. would break up, whatever, but this relationship is worth it. So I'm realizing I'm about to say something stupid, which to me means I'm about to say something that's going to hurt her. Yes. And that's the thing that happens when yes. you have a couples. Eventually, you get to know where the trigger points, where the, where the bullseye's in, and all you have to do is just say the word and you hit the bullseye because all you want to do is win the argument, right? All right. I'm about to say something stupid. I don't want to hurt her. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I buttoned my lip, but I'm about to yep. say it again, and I walked away. Yep. I, I left the room. Go to the gym that was my or... first attempt. Yep. And she followed me. Yes. She followed me going, hey, where do you think you're going? And of course, boom, you know, I, 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 I blew up. I said it, and there it is. Later, I would tell her, love. I'm leaving mm -hmm. because I'm about to say something stupid. I'm about to and hurt you, and I don't want to say it. So I leave. Yeah. My wife said, well, when you do that, it feels to me <laughs> like you're not listening yeah. to me, and you are not taking me into consideration, and you're disregarding me. 
And I said, no, love, that's not what I'm doing. What I'm doing is I'm about to mm -hmm. say something stupid. I can't stop it. And the only way to stop it is if I leave the room. She said, fine. You do that with a promise that once you defuse yourself, yeah. you come back in. You don't blow it off. You, you take that time. And here's what happens when we start doing this. Mm. When we came back in, my willingness to hear her went up. And her willingness to hear me went up. All of a sudden, right. we're you don't able blow it to, off. once again, dialogue, right. talk to one another, communicate. You know, that's the other secret. Communicate with one another. And all of a sudden, we realize that if we have a disagreement in finances, that doesn't mean that I don't love her or I don't think she's smart or vice versa. It, it, it's, we began to separate yeah. apples to apples, oranges to oranges. Our talk about raising children has nothing to do with our relationship. Our talk about finances has nothing to do with our relationship. We were able to separate the different topics mm -hmm. by understanding each other and where we came. But it first had to, we had to diffuse our triggers. And that's how. Yeah. Yes. And get out, even neurologically, that makes sense, because you're getting at it when we're triggered and we're in anger or mm -hmm. intense fear. We're in our amygdala, that reptilian part of the brain. And when you leave and diffuse, you're calming down and you can activate the thinking mm -hmm. part of your brain that can actually take in information and process. Mm -hmm. But let me ask you this, using you and your wife as an example, since that's what we're talking about. You've now, you know, Pulled off, you're back in your prefrontal cortex, mm -hmm. you come back together, you're able to really listen to each other. But after listening to each other, mm -hmm. let's say it's about like public school or private school mm -hmm. or homeschool or, you know, a big decision, right? And at the end of talking about that, mm -hmm. really listening to each other, yes. both of you still have well, we your compromise. yes and your no. And also, one of the what things we have to then? learn is we had to no okay. longer see compromise as a dirty word because when you want to fight, when you domestic, part of domestication is if you're right, you're worthy of love, you're worthy of acceptance, you're worthy of whatever image your 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 ego is trying to set. Now, yeah. here's, here's a good entry to the other question you had about the difference of knowing a barrier. What's the, what's, what's the, what's the word? Um, oh, I just forgot the word. We... No, no, no. It was the word you and I were just using, uh, boundary. What is it a in boundary Spanish? that's set is by it? ego. Ego, the function of ego oh, yeah, boundary. is easier to understand as a function rather than a concept. Yeah. The function of ego is to protect the illusion. And usually the illusion is the model mm -hmm. by which we domesticate ourselves, that image of self that mm -hmm. we have, what is to be a man, what is to be a woman, what is to be macho and all that kind of thing. Personal importance. And we will use it yeah, it's being right is one of the things that I have to be right in order to be worthy. Right. And if I'm wrong, then I'm a loser. Compromise is a loser's bet from that point of view of ego. One of the things yeah. you, is, what is required is to detach compromise yeah. as not being such a dirty word. And it's something that allows us to co-create, something that allows us to find that common ground that allows us mm -hmm. to navigate the choices that's in front of us. You can say, but part of the debate, you know, this is being, having been on the debate team and learning how but, to do that, the whole point, the origin of a debate is finding the, the, the idea that's going to help the tribe best. So that's why you, that was the whole point of a, of a, of a debate. We, Mm -hmm. Yes, what is the plan that serves for the everyone's highest, highest good? good? But somewhere along the line, a debate yeah. became a battle of who is right, who is wrong. And I prefer to be right and you wrong. And this is where we begin to start telling mm -hmm. lies and distorting and spinning and doing all that because it's all about winning. But if you're yeah. willing to find that common yeah. ground, yeah. all right, yeah. what is the thing that yeah. serves us? What is the thing... So from that point of view, it's, it requires one very important thing, the willingness to listen, the willingness to see it from someone else's point of view, to, to see it where they're coming from, 
what does it mean to them? Because if you say no right off the bat, it's a very powerful thing. But if you're saying no, you're shutting down any form of communication. You're shutting down the ability to introduce an idea. And all it's going, it's kind of going, putting your fingers in your ears and going, no, 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 no. I'm not listening. At that moment, all all ability to listen is yeah. over. But <laughs> you're done. the thing is, when you listen, yeah. you're able the to get scrutiny over. to yeah. what you perceive. And if you're able to maintain what is the purpose, what is the focal point, what what do I want, what do we want to create, then, okay, what is the best for our children? You know, we move... Yeah, what's the need, you know, for my son, for my daughter, for example, with my, we, what do our we, children we're need? in a, in a right. crossroads where how to raise a son with special needs without sacrificing my daughter who is excelling at school, finding that balance. She is doing really good mm -hmm. in this environment. Mm -hmm. And if I change the environment, she may not, she might suffer from that even if it's something good from our son so what is the thing that allows us to right. serve both our children and our ability for she and i my wife and i to talk and come together allows us to find that common solution all right we want to move all right audrey is doing great in this alejandro is doing great but he we're thinking about transitioning as he becomes an adult is where we live in a good place for him to be that no the answer is no should we move somewhere yeah. else? Yes. Should we move now? No. Audrey's doing good. Okay. So in four years, when she graduates, we will do a shift. Where are we going to go? Phoenix, Rockland, Portland, San Diego. At that moment, we won't mm -hmm. take anything out of the equation because we need to see what is good for him as Audrey goes off to college. So it's one of those things that putting on the table and keeping the momentum because I, if I get attached to going back home to San Diego and I have to go to San Diego, then I'm going to make that decision. And it turns out to be the worst decision for both of them, especially if I'm yeah. not really checking in and I am the husband. She has to do what I say or this. At that moment, I am closing all channels of communication. And I don't know if I'm about to make decisions that have consequences that are contrary. So in order for that to happen, I let mm -hmm. go of my personal or importance. Them. I, yeah. And the way yeah. to do that is to heal from the wounds that conditional love left in my heart, to let go of my conditioning, mm -hmm. let go of domestication. And once I'm able to do that, I no longer have a barrier, a hurdle that stops me from listening to the needs of my wife, my kids, my, my daughter. And to me, that sounds that, that sounds like the fundamental principle of when you talk about being able to listen is that once you get out of your trigger, you diffuse, you've done healing, you know, whatever it takes, right? Then you can listen with an open mind. Yeah. You can be flexible, not so much to the what you can focus on the how, you know, not so much on the how you can focus on the what it is that you both have as common ground and achieve, you know, what I like to call the win-win. Yeah right? That compromise where both of you are really getting fundamentally what you need, maybe yeah. not in the package you originally anticipated. But, but, <laughs> but an important, important thing is that, you know, even though we've done the work, we get triggered. So one of the big things oh, yeah, to happen do. is to be aware when, you know, and, and you can tell, you know, what I have my triggers, my wife has her triggers, and we can both tell when they're up. When that happens, mm -hmm. we take a step back. All right. Yeah. I'm out. Yeah, we like basically, you know, because she ended up doing the same thing I ended up doing. And, you know, the whole walking away, she has a yeah. walking away point. And she walks away to give me a, that time to diffuse myself, especially if I've been triggered mm -hmm. or Lisa Versa. Mm -hmm. I've, I've learned calling so it knows. out doesn't work. <laughs> oh, honey, your barriers oh, are up. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, all right, that that's doesn't work. Word. Let me try a different way. Yeah. Patience. Okay, patience helps I take, me. Yeah. But here's the thing. I take... I, t I just say, you know what, I'm, and I, I take responsibility, even if it's really him and his trigger, I say, you know what, 
I'm feeling kind of in persona and in my trigger right now, so I'm going to move away, even though it's secretly him yeah. that's in his trigger. And that's the thing. It comes back to him because uh, one of the uh, common questions I get is, well, what about this other person? What about my spouse? What about this? I'm like, I tell yeah. them, remember, you don't control them. No, go no. back to your center. If you realize they're being triggered, take the step back. Now, mind you, I'm not saying yeah. cower or, or recluse yourself. Is This is the difference between knowing your boundary. All right, I want my boundary. I'm going to take the step backwards, but I'm going to stay in my boundary yeah. of, of my assertion. And when the moment comes, I will re-engage. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, yeah. it's ability, an ability to create space or hold space for dialogue. And... Yeah, I think that's so powerful and important. And the hardest thing to do, I mean, that's where most of us fail in, like, that's what leads to the spiral in relationships is not being able to have that kind of healthy dialogue where you're not in your triggers, where you're really able to empathize and, and hear one another. And I think, you know, you were talking about, like, you know that it's not, it's a it's an ego-based boundary, not mm -hmm. sort of a healthy boundary, Um when you're in your anger, I would add to that for, from my perspective, even from lots of women, although women often go to mm -hmm. anger is fear, right? Anytime you're in fear or anger, probably like what I've started to do as someone who's learned, and I'm curious what you think about this as someone who's learned a lot about erecting and holding mm -hmm. our own boundaries over the past five to 10 years, um, is that if I'm in doubt, which I'll very quickly do, cause that's sort of my knee jerk trigger. I literally run what I'm thinking. The only way I can describe it is that I run it through my heart. I like hold, I put all of my attention in the center of my chest and I hold that thought of what I'm mm -hmm. struggling to say yes or no to my boundary in that moment. And if it feel, if my, mm -hmm. if I feel a clench, then I kind of think, and it's, and I, you know, that I can sometimes touch mm -hmm. into, okay, this isn't real yep. Yep. Yeah, I'm what I'm reacting to. You know, versus that sort of mm -hmm. open, full body yes feeling that says, "Okay, sister, yeah. and, and this is a good thing. boundary." Like you got to got to know yourself. It's it's a very important thing. It's like if you want to be that change in that relationship, you're the first person to take it. Now, in in that awareness, you come to realize that fear and anger are the same. In fact, the function of yeah. fear is to keep us safe. Irrational fear is uh, the abuse of it, kind of like abusing alcohol or drugs. We abuse fear like, like that. Mm -hmm. Fear is expressed mm -hmm. through fight, flight, or freeze, and there's also finish. And ex the examples of this is flight yeah, yeah. is, you know, when you, if you have someone in a real danger in front of you, so like a snake or someone with a gun, flight is you're going to run faster than you ever expected you never realize you can run a 5k that fast yeah. even though you've never trained for it you can run it that's what fear does all of a sudden all you can yeah freeze is also when you <gasps> and all of a sudden you you stop making a choice you just freeze and just hope that everything blows over right that's the deer in the headlights that's that's fear response fight yeah. is anger it's a whenever you feel anger yeah. it's really fear something about this situation has triggered mm -hmm. your fight or flight response and the adrenaline that's going through your body is rushing through you that allows you that if you choose to fight you're not going to feel the pain not until the adrenaline goes off and all of a sudden you just feel where that smack yeah. happened or whatever then you feel like that that's yeah. what anger is yeah that anger is, is fight the fight response and fear finish Finish is when you want it to end. For example, um, uh, my brother likes this analogy, and I'll use it because it, it comes to the point. He was in an airport once, and he saw there was a couple there looking through the magazines. The husband had picked up a magazine, and oh, he, was, he looked a little excited, a little happy, and he looked at it going, I want to get this. You know, that, that was the expression in his face. He turns to his wife and he says, look what I got. And she says his name and says, well, let's just say Harold. That's just for example. Oh, Harold, that's not like you. No, that's not you. 
And the man looks at the magazine and yes, dear, you're you're right. And he puts it back in the in the rack. Aww. Basically, that's an example of finish, meaning I am not going to even try. I'm going. I, I know that if I finish it, you know, try. I will be safe, and I'm not. Yeah. That was me. Yeah. So you basically, at that moment, you defuse the situation okay, by fine. letting this person control and dictate <laughs> yeah. everything. So this is fear. You know, you, you yeah. you're afraid of your yes or no. It's a it's a form of finish is basically a form of freezing, but freezing requires not taking a single choice. Yeah. Finishing, you're making the choice to give in, or or subjugate yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, irrational fear is the analogy I have of it. Is imagine going to a movie theater and you watch a, a horror movie. You know, for for me. Poltergeist or the Blair Witch Project the first time I saw it. Yeah, the first time, yeah. The second time, I, it was like, okay, I can see how they did it. And then the, it's not, but the first time I saw it, man, I've yeah. never seen anything yeah. like it. Yeah. Yeah. I felt fear, fright, uh, flight, fight, freeze, and even finish came in. You know, fight is when you scream, ah, oh, that's what? fight. You know, in the, movie, in the movie theater, when people scream, that's the fight response. Fleeing is when you close your eyes and you put your fingers in your ears. I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear. That's freeze is going <gasps> and you gasp and you stop. Yeah. You know, and, and finish is you know, well you I you walk out, you know, it's just like <laughs> you know, or, or something like that. I don't know. Here's the thing. Yeah. It's um it's light yeah. being projected onto a screen with a sound system. You're not in real danger. But the bo the body and the mind get so into the story that they can't tell it anymore. They're completely involved and they will feel that. You will feel fear. Now, here's the thing. The mind yes. is more powerful than any movie projector. We will project the what ifs about life and answer it with the worst case scenario. And we will respond with that fear. We will project onto life that which we are afraid of, yeah. which is the what if. And the answer that we don't like, and we will respond that way. And the danger about that is that we take action when we're really not in it's danger. It's not an illusion. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing to walk out of a movie theater, it's another thing to walk out of your relationship. Yeah. And, that, right? and that's the thing is like so, a lot of fights happen because yeah. we made an assumption about with jealousy. Jealousy is basically comparing myself to someone else and me falling short every time. Yeah. Or insecurity, where like I'm saying no before I give life the chance to say no to me. You, you never know. If you ask, yeah. life might say yes. But it's the, it's the thing that in our lives, yeah. in our relationships, kind of like what we were talking about uh, parenting before, the secret about relationship is that we have no idea what we're doing. We're playing it by ear. Because mm -hmm. just like when we're raising a child, the person we're raising is changing right in front of their eyes. They're changing physically, emotionally intellectually in front of us our beloved is also changing you know this is where release yeah. comes in the willingness to let go of the image my wife is not the same person she was when she was 28 30 35 40 and i'll stop right there my wife has changed <laughs> yeah. because yeah. life has happened do. so if i treat her the same yeah. way i treated her when she was 28 years old i'm in complete disconnect with my relationship i'm in relationship with an illusion the willingness to see yeah. her, the willingness to listen to her, the willingness to be pay attention, and more importantly, to hold space. It took me a long time. To, when she came home and she would complain about her job, she's not expecting me to fix anything. All she wants is someone no, to hear her. Not. It took me a long time to realize. A lot of guys have a hard time oh, with it, that. Oh, yeah, because <laughs> I, 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 whenever someone brings a problem to me, Oh, you're, you're expecting me to have a solution. Fix it. But in, yeah. in reality, she doesn't want me to fix, no. fix a single thing. All she wants, she wants a, is an she wants ear. To vent. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm but, learning and how to do that. Now, I'm, my mom, my mom is entering her 70s and, you know, she's, I'm, she's talking a little differently. She's, you know, she, I can hear her mm -hmm. age. I love her very mm -hmm. much, but I'm learning how to take steps back and realize my, my grand, my mom, you know, is, 
sometimes confused about what something mm -hmm. she made her memory is not the same as she used to be so i take a step back and try to figure out what she's saying instead of reacting the way i used to react when i was a teenager or young when i was younger taking a right. step back and realizing this is a woman who's doing the best with what she's got and she is learning how to be in her 70s and her memory wasn't what she it was she's a little confused but she's still trying her best to stay present. Yeah. And, and that's so that's the fundamental example of empathy, mm -hmm. right? What you're saying is that when we deal with our own stuff and we can become aware of our own triggers and we let go of our own domestication, which is a never ending process, mm -hmm. as you yeah. say, because you're always going to get triggered. That's when we can really do that for our partners and create that in our relationships. Yeah, because we're not going to, we, we have complete confidence that we're not going to get lost in this. Uh, yeah. You know, sometimes yeah. that's a big fear. We can, I'm going to lose myself. And it's all, all of a sudden realize you never really lose yourself. No, you never realize, you never really lose yourself. You're just making uh -huh. choices or making saying yes and no that become automatic. And the only reason why they become automatic is that we start, stop thinking about it. We go to the automatic yes and the automatic no, because we've done it so many times, we become a masters of our own conditional love. Yeah. But if we take that step back and realize what we've done and what direction I want to go to, you know, today we're the youngest we will ever be. How do we want to spend the next few years of our life? What do I want to experience? What do we want to engage? What do I want to feel? The beautiful thing about that is that I get to answer that, you know, and even, yeah, even with my well. wife, you know, we've been together for 17 years and we'll continue to change and evolve. My kids, they're in the middle of their teenage years and they're figuring themselves out. And just in the same way I describe my mom, I'm describing my daughter and my son because, you know, I've taken a yeah. step back and I we're realize it's their journey. And my yeah. job is to be there. Well, for I them. love, I don't know whether I heard you saying this or read this, but I sort of made this metric here where you are saying you know basically this idea that when we heal our own wounds we can trust yes. more and then we can open yes. up more and then we can create more yeah. intimacy um and when we're com and completely yeah. show ourselves yeah. be vulnerable yes. right and and that's really what creates intimacy and you can't you can't give what you what yeah. you don't have so as as i'm always saying too you're saying it in 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 your way and and i've said it too in mine is that the key to every healthy relationship and and healing your relationship starts mm -hmm. with yourself yes. the love we have was it john lennon the, the love we have to li give is equal to yep. the love yep. we live you know um so i thank you so much uh the the book that the most recent book and i want to just quickly hear about your upcoming book but seven secrets to healthy happy mm -hmm. relationships uh, is the name of the book. What's the new book? You, do you have a yeah, book coming October, out soon? You uh, said, the right? Mastery of Life is coming out. Um, it's a book that is, yeah, and it's, it's a book that I wrote. I started writing when I, 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 I took on some apprentices and I began to teach in the framework of Teotihuacan. And the original title was, uh, mm -hmm. the working title, the first one was The Path of the Apprentice. And then I changed it to The, uh, the Path of the Master because that's what we you know become. Yeah. And then my, as my, my publisher, we're, we're working through it. My publisher comes and says, you know what you're really doing here is this is the mastery of life. And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> and, and basically, you know, when you have a title like that, you know, you really up the game okay. because, all right, this is you get the stuff. Yeah. And here's the thing. When we talk about mastery, it's not about imposing my will upon something. We're not talking about that. The mastery is about putting into practice are what we've learned you know if uh, i become a master by Living putting it. into practice that which i've learned and every time i apply it i gain more confidence in myself to be able to do it to say yes to it and as i gain confidence in my ability to make that choice or take that action it becomes faith i have faith in myself to be able to manifest this. Yeah. Yep. And that's, and that's everything. That's it. So um, we'll, 
we will be looking for that book, and you can follow uh, Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. Okay. on social media, right? On um, Is there anything you can tell them if they want more information, the best place to go on your books or your workshops, yeah. or if you want to go well, to the Shamanic Gathering? Well, you can go to my website. It's, it turns out to be the family website, miguelruiz.com. I have a website of my own, miguelruizjr.com, miguelruizjr.com, but miguelruiz.com, that's my father's website, and that's the family's website, so you can find everything that the Ruiz family uh, is doing there. I got to tell you one more thing um, about, speaking of your family, about your brother, Jose, who I obviously saw speak a lot over this weekend as well, and one of the things he says has become a mantra with my girlfriends be, who were with me because he mm -hmm. was talking about this inner dialogue mm -hmm. and our inner domestication, right? And the ways that, and he was using his cell phone as an example. I don't even remember the example, but the ways he said, he was giving lots of different examples of the ways mm -hmm. that he ne would negatively talk to himself or doubt himself or whatever. And, and he said, and I would just say, <laughs> silencio, Jose. Silencio, Jose. And I was like, that encompasses everything. So whenever my girlfriend starts to talk that way, I'll look at her and I'll say, Silencio yeah. Jose. That's a good one. Like, like, oh, so yeah, he, he just, <laughs> you he just put that on a t shirt. He just Silen watched Luca. Silencio Bruno. It, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a good one. Because <laughs> that's exactly it. When, when I heard Silencio Bruno for the first time, I'm like, that's it. That's it. That's the whole, like, the individual dream yeah. is the relationship between me and me. Yeah. If I'm the voice that's talking inside my own mind, who's listening? I am. If I'm the one who's yeah. listening, who's talking? I am. So whenever have a self doubt comes in, silencio yeah. Jose, silencio Bruno, from Luca. Yeah, it's 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 silencio a really Jose. powerful uh, yeah, I like that. quote that's and so an good. instrument. So yeah. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. Yeah, good. Well, tell him thank you for that. And thank you for all the beautiful work you are doing, your whole family is doing. I look forward to the next book, oh, and I thank you for uh, spending your time. I also want to say, Luca, but Laura, <laughs> thank you so much, Laura. 